My name is Rosemary Nyachuwe, and this is the story of my life in how the prophets of God, Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa and Ruth Makandiwa, transformed me. Well, I'll take you back in years to 2006 when my father, my biological father, passed on. He had a ruptured artery and his sickness lasted for close to three years. In a bid to save his life, we were misled by fellow workers and relatives and friends to go to the apostolic sect where we, we assumed we would be able to get help and save his life. But in a bid to save his life, we engaged in a lot of activities uh, and we later realized after we had gone deeper that it was the dark world. My father passed on and because I was already captured and wrapped up in the dark world, I didn't even realize that I was getting nothing out of it. Results were not coming. After the death of my father, as I continued in that journey, I was singled out, out of the family. We are, I'm born in a family of uh, 10. We are 10 children and my mother is still alive. I pursued the apostolic sect. We were under certain prophets. And initially when I went into this act, I thought they were true prophets of God. But I realized that I had gone into the wrong camp. As we went deeper into their activities of the dark world, I was later introduced into another sect, which was like a promotion in the spiritual world, though it was the dark world, which was the mermaid uh, spirits world, the water spirits. This is the place where we worshipped water spirits. But the one thing that I've learned um, from all this was the devil is a liar you will never tell you the truth. And as he drags you into mud, he promises you glitters and gold. I thought I was actually going to get help from these people. And I was then told that I'm actually blessed. I have mermaid spirits where we had to prepare and come up with functions. Little did I know that I was being ordained into something which was much deeper and more spiritual. I had no idea. I thought I was pursuing the gateway to prosperity, yet I was actually opening doorways for demons. It's only now that I'm a Christian that I'm, I'm enlightened and I now know, I look back and I see. But before then, I had no idea I was in darkness. Then from there, I was then introduced to another sect again, which was the ancestral worshipping sect. This includes the witches, the witch doctors, and the other ranks which are above. And I was also told that you are very gifted. You have these spirits. It's a gift that comes from God. And as they were mentioning that these gifts come from God, I was lured to follow them. And they were telling me that these spirits are the ones that minister on your behalf to God. So in a way, they lied to me that we were worshipping God, but via our ancestral spirits. As I was ordained to become one of them, I had gone so much deep by this time into these things. And for me to even see how bad it was, given that it was spiritual, I couldn't even see anything bad. When I would look at Christians, I would actually think that they are the Antichrist, they are Satanists, they are the evil ones, and we were the perfect ones. I saw everything good about what we were doing and everything bad in what Christians were doing. I remember I was mightily used by my then boss um, to bring many to our beliefs and I converted many Christians from believing in the men of God they had and their God into coming into our territory and believing in what we thought was true worshipping of God of which it was a lie. In those days you would never convince me that what I was doing was wrong. 
because I was made to believe it was the right thing to do and I made a deliberate choice independently to follow through and I think because of that, the devil had an edge over me and he managed to take control of my heart and my thinking, my sight, everything. I changed the way I dress. I started dressing like an old woman because I was believing what they were telling me, that I had a grandmother's spirit that was upon me, though it's funny to believe now that I'm enlightened. Um, but. It's only now that I'm realizing that the devil was using it as a strategy for me to look old so that I would not enjoy the benefits of being young whilst time was ticking. Most of the people that I brought to the dark world were men. Most men have a weakness towards the opposite sex, just like the Samaritan woman. Jesus says she had a ministry for men and the devil took advantage of it and look at how many men she had used uh, to sleep with. It's unfortunate these people fell prey and I would take them in, introduce them to my boss. And in that world, we used to respect ranks. We used to respect power and we were never jealous of each other, but we would actually envy to work harder and bring many so that we would be promoted to become better. And there is what they term power there it used to appear as if it was power. I was very powerful in that area of luring men. I remember I was able to call somebody, not through the phone, not via a text message, but by just sitting there. It's only now that I know the word of God, that I'm enlightened and I'm now informed that the devil is just a creation. He was created just like me. And everything that he seems to have, these are things, these are principles that he is stealing from the kingdom of God. And because the children of God, they ignore the word of God and they don't follow through the principles, he takes advantage. He brings them into his dark world, uses them. And because they are spiritual principles, they work. I remember I, I had a wooden plate um, and I would use snuff. In Shona, we call it bute. I was taught that as you, you can just take a handful and as you sprinkle grain by grain into the plate and speak and continuously call out the name of the person you want to come and tell them to come. By the time the snuff is finished, that person will come and it used to happen. And because I had divorced my husband, I'm the one who actually asked him to leave me. I remember him bringing his elderly relatives and begging me, but for that time I was fed up. I didn't want anything to do with him. Of course he had his weaknesses, there are things he had wronged me on, but it didn't warrant a divorce. And the spirits were telling me that I had to divorce him. He was a hindrance to my achieving greater things, remember, in the dark kingdom. So, because I was now a single mom with my monies, the devil lures you and gives you things, but it's never for free. I went on a rampage. I, I would date anyone that I would like, just to see somebody in a BRO, look at them, go to the restroom, take out my snuff, start meditating on him, come back, sit down, buy one drink, that man is gone. And most of the men that I used to go after were married men. For some reason, in those days, I would find joy in making sure everybody gets divorced. It's only now that I see that that was my mission. That was my assignment from the devil, to break people's homes. Men would come. The moment they come to me for love, I would entertain them, sleep with them, and not even use protection. I wouldn't even think about it because I believed that the spirits would protect me even from HIV. Imagine how dull I was. The moment he would sleep with me, then I would know he's gone. I had been told that your beauty is now enhanced with the spirits. And for some reason, if I would just introduce this subject 
about witch doctors and ancestral worshipping. For some reason, every man that I would tell, they would agree, they would say, if you are this beautiful with all this money that you have, in Zimbabwe, people would think it's ancient and backwards. Then they would think, I'm not dull. I'm a graduate. And they would say, with all the education you have, you cannot really be convinced to do something that's not of worth. And because of that, they would come. The moment they would just come into our kingdom, then I'd forget about them, move on to the next one. This was a doorway not just for demons, but even physically for diseases, STIs, HIV, you name them. But for some reason, there's a God in heaven. He is alive. My life was transformed. I'll take you to my transformation point now. Remember, I told you that the devil gives, but he doesn't give you anything for free. He's so cunning. He pretended to had given me wealth and stability, being famous and everything, exposure, but I didn't realize I was losing things bit by bit. Firstly, it was my father. I lost him. And I believe right now that I lost him because I started following a very bad path and I engaged him as well. I robbed him in and he drowned. After my, my father, then my marriage, I lost my husband. I was now a single mom. And after that, I used to work for a very big organization, one that used to command, it was like the chief of, or the captain of the industry. For some reason, that business started going down. Even the government got worried. They were wondering, they would send in investigators and researchers to try and understand what was happening. I still need the voice of God to convince me otherwise, but I believe that business was fought because of me. I was of great influence. The way I rose from one level to the other in that business, I was a mere merchandiser, picking products in the supermarkets. And within a period of two years, I rose to the rank of becoming one of the two regional managers here in Zimbabwe. I would just see a vehicle and ask, what's the name of that car? How much does it cost? And the next week I have it. From my own personal earnings at work. But around 2009, things just started taking a deep dive and things started going down. As other companies were now resurfacing from the 2007, 2008 dip, this company was going the opposite direction of how the economy was turning. I lost my job. I was a very political person and I created chaos. I would actually plan it at home. I didn't know I was working for the devil. I would just think so and so, they think they're better than me. I want to show them. And whatever that I would think or wish for, it would just come to pass. And for some reason, I don't know why people were choosing to follow me. And if I just talk to three, six, nine, ten people, by the end of the day, I have a camp of my own. And they would go and recruit others. And during the weekends, inviting them to one function, that one ancestral ceremony, they would come. As the company closed in 2009, because I was careless and reckless, all the money that I used to have, I would enjoy using it with boyfriends and men and just giving out and having these silly parties. I could afford to have a party every day at my house. People would gather because I was told by my bosses then that as people will be gathering at my house, so will be wealth. So for some reason, I believed that the wealth would come. It's actually an advice to you viewers out there. Don't just go to any party. You never know the spirit behind the party. You never know the agenda or the objective of the one who's holding the party. Anyway, before my turning point, we went deeper and it was risky. It's only now that I am out that I can see the risk. I remember we went to the caves and there's a particular cave here in Zimbabwe 
which is actually on top of a flowing river, a very big river. We call them Madziva in our vernacular language. When we went there, myself, right now as I'm sitting here, I can't swim and I'm so scared of water. I don't even want to go anywhere near, even, even at my own house. I don't even use the shower. I don't, I, I don't enjoy the, the feeling of water eating over my head. But because the bosses had said so, I believed in them. And we went to these Madzivas, the, the caves. When we went there, the, the snuff that we used to take in, um, it was like a drug. Because the moment you would take it in and sniff it, it would make you have this feeling like you are drunk or a carefree spirit whereby you can do anything. You can even jump from a rooftop and you are not even thinking. Probably the same feeling, I'm not sure, but maybe the same feeling with the one people who use these drugs here. Yeah. So after sniffing, imagine I dived into the waters and I went deep. I have no idea how many meters I went deep. But I remember my eyes were open. I don't know which eyes were open, physical or spiritual, but I could see. I could see clearly and there were weeds, there were snakes, a lot of fish, crabs, and some other things that I don't even know what the names are. I remember among the traffic that was going against me, there was a huge snake. This snake was huge, but I wasn't even afraid. I couldn't see where it was starting from and where it was going, where the head or tail was. And imagine to think that an anaconda pig like that would see prey like me. I was food to it, but it didn't even consume me. There was a life under the water where people could actually sit and breathe and eat and have children. And under the water, this is where the bosses would reside. But for some reason, I think I blanked out because I only remember going in. What happened and where I ended, I have no idea. I only remember coming out. And as I came out, I think it was well after a couple of hours because people were beginning to get worried that I wasn't returning. And they started praising the ancestral spirits for bringing me back. But they had no idea that it was God. After all has been said and done, for me to actually engage into these activities right from the beginning, I had a friend, we shared the same name. And this is the exact friend who had introduced me to her brother, a cousin brother, a distant relative, who later became my husband and married me. So for some reason, I felt like we owed it to her. She was like important to us as a family. Little did I know that she wasn't a friend, but an enemy. She's the one who introduced me to the apostolic sect, moved with me to the um, water spirits, and later into being a witch doctor. I even remember people coming and they needed help, especially in marriages. I feel sorry for people who are married. They would come and think they are, they are seeking help. Imagine. And for some reason, I would just look at them and see. Whatever that I would tell them, they would say, it's true. And after they are gone, I would start laughing with my family and say, how could they say it's true? I don't even know them. I, I wasn't seeing anything. But for some reason, when they went back home and did exactly as I told them, their myriad would seem like it had changed. So people believed in me. And I gained respect in the family. People didn't respect me, actually. It's a lie. They feared me because they feared that probably if they crossed my path, I would kill them or hurt them because they thought I was powerful. Now, um, my mentor, this friend, then died mysteriously. 
she just had a leg pain and in three days she was dead. And because I was told that when you are into these things, you will not die because the spirits would protect you from witches and every bad omen. This shook me. And this brings me to the scripture where it says, in the year King Uziah died, I saw the Lord. In the year that my friend died, I saw the Lord. I think this was the doing of God. The prophet of God, Emmanuel Makandewa, he always teaches that when God remembers you, he gives you a man. I saw it. God gave me a man. God remembered me. My journey to, the, to my salvation, I just didn't land in the church. Remember, I had lost my job. My father was dead. So I was left exposed. I didn't have any pillar to lean on. And the only pillar that I was left with was from the spiritual side, who was my friend. And she had died again. So I was really exposed now. And I didn't know what to do, whom to turn to, because all the people that were around me were coming to me for advice and help and to be strengthened. So for me to even go to people and tell them that I'm troubled, it, was, it wasn't proper. Anyway, then poverty came into play. Mr. Poverty came over me and he possessed me big time. I started suffering. I remember I had a house in Wesley. This is a stand that I bought. There was just the syllab, the footing for foundation. I built that house. It was only a 700 square meter yard. It was big. It was beautiful. But I sold it. But for me to explain to you right now what I did with the money, I can't even point out it anything significant. But the Lord was blessing me, but I couldn't see it. I bought another house in Warren Park D, a beautiful seven-roomed house. I finished it, I renovated it, gated, walled, put a slab inside, outside. Everything was spectacular about this house. Everybody loved it. And people were actually wondering why I was investing into a building that was in the high-density suburbs. But I wanted to live large. I needed to be on a neat place. But now that I was unemployed, it took me a long time for me to realize that I was now lacking. And I had to adjust my way of living. But I had gone for a very long time, a very long period, maintaining the same standard that I was living when I was still employed and well paid. So in that period, I accumulated a lot of debts. I used to owe, and it worried me. The debts were huge and massive to the extent that I had to sell that house. So after I sold the house, the only thing I managed to do was to buy a stand in Norton, a very small stand, 250 square meters. And that was it. All the money was finished. All the friends began to run away, including my own family. It was just me and my brother. I remember my mom, my biological mother, she took my children. My kids were taken away from me because they could see that I couldn't look after them. So I began moving from one house to the other, begging. Because people used to benefit from me earlier, they were giving me. But because they are human beings and they are not God, they became tired and they became so mean. They resisted me. Poverty was extreme. I couldn't even afford petroleum jelly to apply on my skin after taking a bath. Taking a bath was actually a miracle because the water was closed by the municipality. It was shut down because my bills had accu accumulated. Having electricity would use the light that was coming from the tower lights because we didn't have power, we were cut off. It became bad. And at that point, I was left in a world where I believed it was just me and my brother. 
I remember my brother would go to the shopping centers. We used to live near a very popular shopping center in Warren Park, where people usually come for brides and having fun. He would go and wait there in the same manner that the dogs at Merrick, that's the name of the place, behave. Those dogs there, if you go and observe them even today, they wait for you to eat until you finish. And the bones and the suds that still left that you, that you throw away, that's what they go after. And this is exactly what my brother started to do. And we would celebrate and rejoice that today these bones, they've got a bit of flesh. I managed to have two bites and we were grateful. But it came to a point in time when business was now low at the shopping center. My brother stopped going there because there was nothing coming out. Sometimes we'd just sleep and just drink water. Sometimes we'd just sit and look at each other. Until one day my phone rang, an uncle of mine called me. Instead of celebrating and greeting him and asking how the family is, I started crying. I narrated to him how I was suffering. But him knowing the person that I had been before, it was hard for him to believe. He then said, are you sure this is what you're going through? Then I said, yes. I'll quote his words. He said, how the mighty have fallen. And it offended me because I was in dire need and he was making fun out of me. Little did I know that salvation had come. Then he said, do you know that God has blessed me? I've got three shops now in three different suburbs. And the things that you're saying you're lacking, mealy milk, cooking oil, the basics, those are the things that I'm even giving to others, strangers who are not even my relatives. Then I said, wow, thank God. So, uncle, you're going to help me. Then he said, no, bad news to you. I'm not going to give you anything. Then I said, but why? How can you be so cruel? Remember, I used to help you as well with your rentals. Then he said, I know. That's why I'm not going to give you anything. I'll not give you my groceries. I'll not give you my money. But what I will do is I will introduce you to my source. It's only now that I realized that my uncle was not greedy. He was generous. Then he said, I've got a source where I managed to get my breakthrough as well. My uncle had been married for 17 years and they were barren. They tried everything. I'm their relative, ask me, I know. They tried everything, be it doctors, what, everything. They took in everything and they had no child. So he broke the news to me that I went to UFIC and I said, what is UFIC? Is it a new clinic? Imagine I didn't even know we had a church in the same city that I live. I was that wicked that time. And then he said, this church, if you heard of a man called Makandiwa, then I said, yes, I've heard about him, that Satanist. And then he said, yes, how would you want to be associated with a Satanist who has given me children? And we are looking forward to be having more children. I couldn't believe him. Then I said, mm, there he goes, he has started his stories. Then he said, if you think I'm lying, you can come. This is when he invited me to church now. It took about two to three months from that time that we had the conversation to the first time that I then came to church. After that conversation, for some reason, I forgot all about it. I lost his number. I didn't even call him. I couldn't even recall the conversation we had had. But in me, developed this emptiness, this fear, I don't know what to call it, whether it was a gap or an edge, a drive. I knew I wanted something, but I had no idea what it was. Then as I was sharing with one lady who lived in our street, she said, I think you need God. Then I looked at her, I laughed my lungs out. I said, God, me, God. Even if he's there, do you think he would ever accept me? And she said, my sister, there is a God in heaven. Then I said, don't even talk to me about that. I was very anti-God. 
I, I said, if God is there, how can you let me suffer like this? I was just looking for reasons not to worship him. But even if I had told you off, in me, I felt it that I needed God. But to gather the strength to even kneel down and pray, knowing that God is omnipresent, to be honest, I failed to do it on my own. And then I went back to her and she invited him, church reverend. When the church reverend came, I wouldn't want to judge her. The word of God says, touch not my anointed, but I think she was empty, given where I was coming from. Everything she said did not make sense. Probably she is a cold woman of God, but probably not for me. She wasn't for me. I felt that she's going to waste my time. So by the time she finished, my heart was already outside. Then I said, thank you, my sister, but uh, this one will not help me. I'll not even allow you to pray for me. Because if she prays for me, she will not be able to face the woes that will come to her. So I think let me save her. I moved to another church. I will not mention names. I think I went to four different churches. The other ones are traditional churches and the other two are Pentecostal churches. And the other one, when I was seated in the church, remember my background, I was very spiritual, but from the other side, I could pick the level of the man of God just sitting in the congregation. I would look at him and feel sorry for him and walk out. 2011 September, I thank God for what happened. My uncle called again and invited me to a conference for the UFIC church. And the event was going to be held in the Glamis Arena. I told him that I couldn't attend because I didn't have transport money. He drove all the way from Greendale to my place in Warren Park. It's plus or minus 30, 35 kilometers. And he left us, um, me and my brother, $5. And he told us the starting time. I remember I went there, it was in September 2011. It was extremely hot. I had never been that hot before in my entire life. I'm not sure whether I was manifesting or it was the real temperatures for the day, but it was hot. And this was in a stadium. We were seated, I remember the chairs were arranged in the ground. And the man of God, Prophet Emmanuel Makandio, was conducting the service. I remember the same one that he was preaching that day. I will never forget it. It was about prophetic regions. When he was giving a teaching on Jacob, that when he saw the open heavens, he had gone to Bethel. So sometimes in our lives, when God brings down our blessings or our destinies, we have to be prophetically alert and spiritually we must open our eyes so that we know where the blessing is, so that we are in the right place at the right time, so as to be able to receive. As I was seated there, I, I think I was about to faint because the heat was extreme. I couldn't bear it anymore. So he asked us to pray. This is where the problem began. Pray, saying what? To who? And when I opened my eyes, I saw everybody was murmuring, moving up and down and praying. And I said, what are these people saying? I just kept quiet, to be honest. I didn't say a word. After the prayer, we sat down. Then he began ministering. I remember he gave a prophecy to somebody who had a diarrhea problem. And immediately after that, he said, as we are seated there, let's begin to pray for him. And you can also ask God for anything that you want. Then I said, this man, he has started again. He wants to tempt me to ask for anything. Does he even know what I want? and what kind of a person I am. Because I had heard a lot of things about him from people who were not even knowledgeable about him, who didn't even know him. So I had joined those people who would criticize him and speak ill things about him. I used to hate him, but I didn't even know him. Then as I closed my eyes to pray, seated there in the sun, 
I remember I made a very short prayer. I said, God, if you are there in heaven for real and you are hearing me, dacha, it means I'm burning, I've burned. Can you do something? As I finished saying those words, I felt a very cool breeze, just like the one that you feel in summer when you open a deep freeze. It was so refreshing, cool, and moist to the extent that I had to take a scarf out of my bag to cover my hands because I was actually freezing. I think the temperature for my fingers and toes had gone down to zero. And I said, wow, somebody behind me has opened an umbrella. For me to think it was a miracle, it, it didn't click in my mind. I thought somebody had opened an umbrella from behind and after the prayer, when we'd open our eyes, I would say thank you. So after the prayer, people, everybody said amen. And as I turned to ask the person who was seated behind me to say thank you for being generous, we are sharing the same umbrella. I saw the people who were seated behind me. They were in the sun, exposed, burning worse than me. They were sweating. Someone was even fanning herself with a book. And then I looked upwards. I didn't see anything. I looked besides me. Everybody was in the sun. And when I looked at my, at my legs, I saw a shadow. I'm not a child. I'm an adult. I know what a shadow is. I saw a shadow, like there's something between me and the sun, which is creating this shadow. I was in a shed. And as I continued to look and to check, the ushers who were close by, they thought I was manifesting because they didn't, they couldn't see what I was seeing. So they just, they just kept eyeing me, looking at me and trying to understand what's going on. When I told the lady who was seated next to me that I am in a shed, I'm not in the sun. She looked at me like this and then she looked back to where she was looking. She just thought this one is crazy. Then I said, true, my sister, I'm in the shed. I'm not even feeling what. Then she said, it's okay. She thought I was losing up my mind. Then I said, for real, you can feel my hands. So it was only after she felt my hands. Then she said, hey, you are cold. What's going on with you? Then she looked and saw the shed. As she tried to tell the other people, the shed disappeared. But there was proof that a miracle had happened. I was still feeling very cold. And people could actually feel the temperature of my body. But I didn't even give that testimony. I had no idea it was a testimony. But it instilled fear in me. I said, hey, what kind of a church is this? And what kind of a God is this that they worship? That does things there and there. How could Prophet Emmanuel Makandwa ask me to ask God for anything? He mentioned it. He said, ask for anything. And when I asked, I thought I had asked for something that was too hard or impossible for God. But it happened. At that moment, I was tempted to believe that Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa was a true man of God. But because of the stubborn spirits that were still possessing me, it all ended in that service. I didn't share with anyone. And then my uncle called again the next week. And he said, our grandfather, Prophet Victor Boateng, is coming into the country. He's coming from Ghana. He's coming to minister. Please come. Then I said, Boateng, who is that? But because I, I, I thought later on he would give us food from his shops, I had to follow. Then I went to the Sunday service where Prophet Victor Boateng was ministering. I remember the service. Because of his tone, being a Ghanaian, and I'm a Zimbabwean, it was my first time to hear him. I couldn't even hear what he was saying. I could just see him from afar. But I remember you just mentioned Aunt Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Calamite. And then I remember when we were about to pray, you would say, say, bring me back my baby. So that's all I had. So I would just pray and say, bring me back my baby, bring me my baby, bring me my baby, until the end of the service. And I went home. When I went home, I slept. I started dreaming the prophet of God, Prophet Emmanuel Makandio. And as I started dreaming about him, 
Being a heathen then, I didn't understand what the dreams meant or how valuable they were. Prophet Emmanuel Makandua is addictive. His word, the way he speaks, the way he teaches, when you hear him once, even if you don't understand anything, you'd want to hear him again. So I kept thinking, I need to go back to that man again. So when I went for the next service, I remember I changed the position that I was seated on and I had to hold my chest like this, looking at him and wondering, how can a human being with two legs like me explain the Bible like this? How does he read it? It was a mystery to me. And as he was teaching, my eyes began opening. I remember in one service, he said, do we have people who would want to give their lives to Christ? Before he even finished, I was up on my feet. Raise up your hands, pray after me. And that's how I received Jesus Christ. And it was a happy moment for me. I didn't know how valuable it was then, but the man of God helped me to make a very good choice. The most important choice that I have ever made in life to receive Christ. And being a follower, I now started looking for bus fare from people. I used to borrow to buy food. Now I was borrowing to come to church. I wanted to hear him more and more and more because the way he was teaching, it was like, if he teaches this subject today, next week, the next subject links you to the next subject and you wouldn't want to miss anything. I remember those days he was talking about dreams and visions, about Joseph, and you'd want to hear so from dreams and you'd announce next week we'll be teaching on visions. You'd want to come for the visions. After that, you'd want to come for the next sermon. So I didn't want to lose anything because his teaching, his, I fell in love with his word. I had not seen the prophetic part yet, but I had just seen the teaching of the word of God. And as he was teaching, I was grasping concepts. That's when I was realizing, oh, this is, oh, this is exactly what I used to do. Also, I should do it this way. Oh, this is the reason why this happened. And from the teachings, I later learned that there are, there are some that are called spiritual husbands. And I later learned that there are what are called blood covenants and a lot of things. And that's when I re remembered that I had made a covenant with the devil. I was enlightened. And after the service, um, I remember I went to one pastor and I was so keen. I wanted to know what, what can I do more? The way he was teaching after the service, he would leave you with this hunger to, to want to know more. And it was so bad those days because I didn't have any DVDs, neither did I have a Bible. So from one Sunday to the next Sunday, it was a long way for me. So when I spoke with this pastor, then he said, um, the man of God always encourages us to come for the healing sessions. You said you were a witch doctor. And then I said, yes, but I was looking for a powerful man of God because I know that when you want to surrender these things, they, when the spirits start coming after you now, they can actually kill you. So I didn't want to be killed and I didn't want to cause any death to anyone. Then he said, don't worry. The God that we worship in this house, the God of Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa, there's nothing that is too hard for him. So I then um, brought all the tools that I used to use in the Dark Kingdom, all of them, to the house of God, to UFIC. It was during a healing session. It was on a Monday. And the man of God, Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa, prayed for me. He delivered me from all the spirits that he had put me into bondage. And he advised me to hand over the tools to the pastor, our intercession pastor, who later bent the things. Extremely opposite to my fears, I thought after burning the things, then I would just die because that's what I had been made to believe. But I did not die. I'm still living. This was 2012, and we are in 2016, exactly four years later. I'm still alive and kicking, even more happier. Then my journey through the transformation, it was basically the word that he taught. The man of God, Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa, he's a seer. The man is blessed. He has got special grace to dissect and explain the word of God. 
the same scriptures we read at home, when he explains them in the service, you'll be going, wow, the whole time. You'll be amazed. And when you go back home and apply the word that he teaches, it works. It's actually active. It's more alive than breathing creatures. Of all the sermons that he taught, the most powerful for me was the dangers of fornication. Given my background, I had no idea that they are what are called spiritual ties. He taught on them. He taught on so many things that when you fornicate, you're actually sinning, not just to God, but against your own body. And the Lord does not like it. And the repercussions of adultery and fornication and all the, se the sexual sins, he taught on them. And that is the day that I made a decision that I will never sleep with a man who is not called my husband. And being a single mom, a woman who has been married before, I used to live with a husband. I lived with my husband for 12 years. And living for such a period of time, all these years, abstaining from sex, I know for sure, I know myself, I couldn't have done it had it not been with the help of the Holy Spirit through the man of God, Prophet Emmanuel Magandio. And if people ask me, how are you surviving? Don't you have feelings? How, how do you manage it? To be honest, I don't even have a formula. It's just grace. It's the work of God. I am glad to announce that my family has been saved right from my mother. She, she is now a born again Christian. It's amazing to look at her and to listen to her speaking in tongues. My mother, it's amazing. My brothers were the most drunkards that you have ever seen. Every gathering we would have, they would fight. But the way they love the word of God, the way they buy and listen to the DVDs of the teachings of Prophet Makandio, it's amazing. Everybody loves the prophet in our house because he has transformed our lives. He has changed me. One thing that I know that broke my marriage was anger. I would get angry, and I think it was the, with the help of demons as well. I would get angry to the extent that I would feel my blood boiling. It would end after I hit someone. Even my own husband, he was in trouble. That man, I think he was patient. It's just unfortunate that it was during the time of being ignorant. And I want to thank God, because through the teaching of the Word of God, Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa teaches us during the services that for you to make a step ahead, you have to you have a self-retrospect. In one choose the service, he actually gave us an example that his biological father, our grandfather, um, Sekuru Makandiwa, he taught him when he was a little boy that young men have an, ex an exercise book that you write every day and you mark yourself. You look at what you have done during the day. You are alone in your bed. And be honest to yourself. And tick and put an X where you still need attention. And in that way, you'll be improving yourself and becoming a better person. I adapted the same teaching and applied it in my own life. Sometimes I'm actually shocked. I'm the one who is always shocked that, is this me? So is this all that I have to say? Why am I not shouting? What kind of a person am I? I can no longer be that angry. Sometimes I try to be harsh even to my own children, but I can't even do it anymore. Even the way I used to desire men, I no longer have that desire. It's a miracle that the men and woman of God, the two prophets in my life have worked. When I look at Mama Prophetess Ruth Makandio, she teaches when we go for ladies' meetings. Though her teachings are not as many as my father's, but they are very powerful. Mama teaches us. She teaches us the true facts of life. She teaches us how to be a woman, how to be a mother, how to be a wife, how to be an employee at work, how to be an employer, how to start projects. That woman that you see, is a full package. There's nothing else. If I tell you from the time that I started going to UFIC in 2011 up to this day, 2016, 
I have never had a one-on-one -on -one prophecy with the man of God, Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa. I was made to believe that people go in their numbers because they are after the prophetic. But as for me, it is the word of God that he speaks, that God speaks to me through him, that has changed me. And here I am, speaking to you like this, calmly like this, it's a miracle on its own. When I see people being healed during the services, some will be having chronic and critical cases. The greatest miracle that I have ever witnessed is to see somebody like me with all the men that I slept with, without protection, carelessly, not being infected at all with HIV and AIDS. I believe the prophet of God, Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa, has been a father to me ever since I was in my mother's womb. Prophets are ordained when not when we see them, but when they are created by God. Just like God told Jeremiah, the prophet taught in a sermon that Jesus said to Nathaniel and Philip, I'm not seeing you just now. I saw you when you were seated under the tree, when he found you. And I believe even those days when I was still ignorant in the world, the prophet had already been ass assigned by God to oversee over my life, being my spiritual father. And I want to thank God of Prophet Emmanuel Makandiwa for the two prophets that he gave in my life. Had it not been for them, I could have been dead by now through diseases or accidents or any other thing that can happen to someone who is just exposed. My family is happy. They love the prophets. It's not just me. It's my sisters, their husbands, my brothers, their wives, their children. Everyone is at peace. And this grace, it's not common. It only comes from Jesus Christ. So this is the story.